Okay, so we are going to move on to our second theme of this conference. Uh, language, narrative, and power in mass media. Um, so I would love to um, introduce uh, Rawa uh, Johannes, um, who will be uh, opening um, the second theme, um, talking about racial bias in Norwegian media, uh, looking into the, the language, narrative, and power in mass media. Uh, thank you, Rawa. And again, uh, apologies for um, the delay. Yeah, for your... Oh, no worries. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, I'm just going to talk about uh, the racial bias in the Norwegian media. As Kaman said, my name is Rahwa uh, Johannes. <clears throat> and uh, I would like to extend a thank you to the Oslo desk for organizing this conference as it is very important. Uh, and very relevant to um, our society here. Um, in February, uh, there came out a report on national security briefings. The Norwegian Police Security Service and the Norwegian Security Authority held a joint press conference together with the minority of uh, the Ministry of Justice. Um, These assessments are published in addition to the press conference where the media gets to ask questions. Um, so Aftenposten, one of the uh, three biggest newspapers in Norway, had an article summarizing the press conference. The first bulletin read, Islamist extreme violence is the biggest threat. No, is still the biggest threat. The written report positions both right-wing extreme violence and Islamic, Islamist extreme violence as equally likely nor is it expressed at any point in the press conference. The same article frames right-wing extremism as a growing threat. Nothing about how likely right-wing extremism violence is just as Islamist extreme violence. Norway has only seen right-wing extreme violence in reality. August, 2014, James Foley, uh, a journalist was killed by the Islamic State. I observed my friends and others on Facebook change their profile pictures to black, to black in solidarity. January 2015, 12 people were killed in Paris, again, by an Islamist extreme terrorist. Everyone comes out in solidarity and just we, uh, Charlie is everywhere. April 2015, 30 Ethiopians are killed by the same organization in Libya, shot and beheaded on camera. This story barely makes it to the news in the Norwegian mainstream media. There was no uproar or outrage by the murder of so many people in such a gruesome way as the rest of the Islamic State killings. I found myself asking, where is the same solidarity shown to the 12 people killed in Paris from the media and from the society? But I can't blame the society for not showing solidarity when they don't know what happened. There was Paris and then there was Brussels and Orlando and these received attention. Then there was Christchurch, and now last week, eight people were killed. One thing these two incidents have in common is that the terrorists are white and the Norwegian media had little interest in covering them. The Norwegian media had very clear responses to the different incidents. All times where, there, where the perpetrator was a Muslim extremist, there was a lot of attention and pictures of incidents plastered on the front pages. Meanwhile, the times where the perpetrator was a right-wing extreme Caucasian terrorist, the front pages seem to have more important things to frame like new uh, treat treatments for headaches and football. These are things that have frustrated me over the years, but also gave me a very clear message. Any issue to do with racialized population in our society is often under the microscope only when it has something to do with violence, racism, refugee issues, or some other negative phenomena that is popular at the moment. Otherwise, very unlikely other topics on the agenda setting list. The coronavirus and infection rates have been the past year's theme both around the majority and the racialized peoples in Norway. There have been a lot of priming of immigrants and their environments. The majority of immigrants in Norway are Swedish and Polish, but when words such as immigrants are used, 
um, it is implicitly synonymous with racialized peoples. There have been many articles about how infection rates are highest among immigrants. Immigrants didn't respect the set guidelines for containing infections. Uh, they don't report contagion, etc. In most cases, however, there, are, there was no context for how immigrants have jobs that put them at higher risk or infection uh, of infection as they have to physically be present or the other underlying issues such as living conditions that make it difficult for them to socially distance and lack of access to information. So when George Floyd was murdered last year, people all over the world mobilized in support and solidarity of the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States. Norway joined in, in the conversation. The media discussed the police brutality issues in the United States, the structural racism and the historical causes as well as the protests. Many on social media in the meantime were sharing their own stories of racism in Norway. And most of the work I have engaged in anti-racist movements is in Norway have been root rooted in the black experience. When George Floyd was murdered, we already had a committee that was set up for another campaign and we decided to organize the demonstration in Oslo. We didn't think it was going to be as big as it was in the beginning, but we wanted for once to be the owners of our own issues and narratives. The even page we had put out with, had uh, within less than 25, uh, 24 hours, uh, 16,000 responses and we had four days to go at the end of, and at the end it was nearly 65,000. We weren't the only ones, there were many other groups in different cities in Norway organizing their own demonstrations. Of course, the media got a whiff of this and had to engage in what was happening in Norway. But suddenly, the discourse went from US has a problem with racism to corona numbers and the legality of organizing demonstrations, not about why people wanted to demonstrate or why it gained so much traction. I personally received uh, many questions asking me if we thought of Corona at all. Uh, never mind that we communicated this clearly on the statement in the event page and all other communications. Some asked me why I'm why I am importing a problem that isn't ours. Again, already in the statement, the U.S. isn't the only place with police brutality issues. Um, we wanted to demonstrate in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement in the U.S. But we also wanted to address the problems our communities face within uh, the police and its abuse of power. In many of the interviews I did, I mentioned that the US is just the obvious case of a global white supremacist problem. If I recall right, there was maybe one that quoted me on that and I spoke to countless journalists. The demonstrations took place in Oslo and estimated 15,000 people came out in support of the cause. The movement, the crowd, the moment the crowd dispersed, after a long line of speakers who spoke about their grief, the racism issues in Norway, or seeing all the posters with lists of names of people whose lives were stolen by racists in Norway, such as Eugene Ejk Obiora or, or Benjamin, followed by how do you assess the infection situation? Now, I'm not a doctor or an epidemiologist. After this, the organizers and the owners of the issue, uh, anti-Black racism and racism in general, were no longer interesting for journalists. The discourse was co-opted by politicians about whether the demonstrations were responsible, the speculations for the infection rate, rates, uh, or whether racism is a problem in Norway. In addition, another topic was introduced to the discourse, namely the statue debates. Oslo is a very small city. 15,000 people came out to take a stand against racism, and the discourse was still trying to decide whether racism is an issue in Norway. Many important voices drowned in it, and for many, this was a new thing. But for us in the margins, this is our daily lives, and yet the loudest voices in the debate were not people in the margins. Media analysis of the topic racism in the wake of George's, uh, George Floyd's mur murder and, and the emergence of Black Lives Matter movement was done by Retriever, sponsored by Fritur. The purpose was to do analysis of the media coverage on racism, um, and it was in the period between the beginning of May and the end of August last year. The analysis took into consideration the mainstream media, regional newspapers, and the alternative media. However, 
media outlets such as Oslo Desk, uh, which was one of the main covers of the demonstrations and the racism debate, Chrono and Utru, uh, who portray more critical views and a more inclusive content were not considered. The report was conducted with a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods. The main takeaways from the report were the media is a biased, minorities were represented, and the discourse wasn't as detrimental as claimed. Only 18% 18 uh, 18 of the articles uh, were written by members of the media, while the other published articles were chron chronicles uh, or opinion pieces by individuals and other actors. Police brutality in Norway was discussed in 2% of the ra uh, racism-related articles. To give you a bit of context here, the demonstration we organized called for the implementation of a pilot project that was supposed to be done in 2003 to measure uh, the amount of times uh, the police stop minorities. So that we can further issue uh, usually prominent uh, and important in the racism discourse in Norway is discrimination at work. Minorities are 25% equal qualifications as the other candidates. And this was discussed only 1% of the material analyzed. Meanwhile, statues were discussed 6% of the time when the people who came out demonstrating or the organizers did not call for it. A white politician did, and we had other priorities. <clears throat> the report did not define racism. It just started, uh, it just stated that the structural racism was one of uh, the main topics discussed, when really the discussion was mainly stuck on symptomatics. Just because the expression was used, it doesn't mean that the conversation actually tackled the institutional racism and its manifestations in depth. I'll refer again back to the how little the discourse on police abuse of power and discrimination in hiring was discussed. The report also stated that the pictures used in the domestic reporting of racism weren't emotionally charged or weren't meant to evoke emotions. The media coverage of the Sian or Stop the Islamization of Norway um, and the counter demonstrators uh, were extremely charged in that there was a lot of violence and negatively charged depictions of these incidents. It is also important to note angles taken in reporting about Sian. Nothing about the coronavirus, rather the conflicts, not much about racism unless they were coming from minorities as interviewees. Sometimes how they are targets of violence, that is Sian and not the other way around. Um, there was an underlying message uh, of portraying the people protesting Sian as aggressive while at the same time by the police and the escalating nature which the police Acted, which created distance. And the media didn't manage to get away from what was happening in the US and individual stories about everyday racism. It failed in discussing the embedded structural and institutional racism in Norway. And what the report called the meta debate, defining racism, most of the definition articles were done by the editorial which then begs the question, who has the definition power? Why weren't there a larger representation of minority voices in the discourse? The report also failed to address how the media contributed to the escalation of uh, the Keogh debate about decolonizing the institution by extensively writing about the five students that criticized the proposed curriculum changes, as well as not properly fact-checking uh, and distorted imagery of what actually was going on at Keogh which again contributed to the digression and confusion and distortion of important issues. So my point is, ask yourself why there aren't enough minority experts represented unless they are there to talk about diversity and racism or be the token person of color. Why is the coverage of terrorist attacks by Caucasians so low and why do the media bend over backwards to humanize the perpetrators and dig deep into all the good things they did before the terrorist act? Why frame the negative sides of minorities when the major majority of population does uh, just as much negative acts? Why portray protesters fighting for their dignity and their rights as human beings, as aggressive and violent? If you're able to answer these questions, I believe you'll see the racial bias in the Norwegian media. Thank you. <laughs>